Okay, well, I just got back from seeing Final Destination 5, and before you ask, no, I haven't seen anyone else's review of this yet. I know Brad likes to go to the midnight screenings. He's actually made this, uh, I'm actually very impressed with Brad's setup now. He's, he might actually make this a thing, where he's got, uh, he's, he's got all these people he can send out to the midnight screenings, and they talk about it. I, I do wonder sometimes about the logistics of shooting in the inside of a car, <laughs> but, uh, He's, he's actually got, you know, he's, you're familiar now with all his friends and the way they think and stuff like that. I really, I really like it. Um, but I haven't seen it because I didn't want to spoil the movie for myself yet. And uh, spoilers are actually, uh, there are things to spoil in this flick, which, yeah, surprised me. Uh, it's it's kind of funny that way where the, this, this series has, has uh, well, after the first one there's no surprises. Um, I have not actually seen any of the Final Destination movies since the first one because... They're all the same, you know. They 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 really are. I mean, <laughs> okay. I I'm gonna ramble on a little bit, and um, I might jump from topic to topic here. The first topic I have to mention is the uh, the previews I saw for. You, you want to talk about unnecessary sequels? They're doing a new Harold and Kumar movie. Uh, it's like a very three a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas. And oh my god, really? At, at this point. You remember when it was like, uh, you remember when Kevin Smith did Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back and it was literally nothing more than just, than just Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes in front of the camera, just farting around and hitting each other and, <laughs> and, and making a bunch of inside jokes and, and making a bunch of movie references for basically no reason. Just, just kind of a strung together series of fart jokes and, and movie sketches. That's, that's what the, a uh, very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas is. It's really just watching Harold and Kumar kind of bounce off the walls and, and do their shit, get stoned, and and uh, watching Neil Patrick Harris resurrected for no real reason, just doing his Neil Patrick Harris shtick, which is awesome. I mean, really, come on. If you like NPH, you're going to see this guy no matter what. But um, the Harold and Kumar series after the Guantanamo Bay thing really started to, to wear thin, and it didn't help that Dr. Uh, Dr. Ken is in this movie. I, seriously, Dr. Ken has reached the level of annoyance to me where if I know he's in that movie, I'm not seeing it. Really. I mean, it, his, his shtick is so bad. He he is he costs at least one ticket sale, no matter what he's in. He costs one. Seriously, I, I, he, he is, he's like fucking nails in my eyes. Um, what else was there? John Carter of Mars. Is that what it is? I think it's John Carter of Mars. Yeah. Um... Um, nothing really of substance. There was a lot in the way of um, oh, there was a what was it called? Ah, um, uh, there's there's a Matt Damon movie about a, a disease that kills everybody just by touching people. Like it's delivered by just any kind of physical contact, and it's that movie kind of looks freaky. I don't know that, that one. That, there's potential in that one. There's also another movie that didn't look anywhere near as good about these weird aliens that descend from the stars. Where else would they descend from, right? Um, they, they, these weird aliens that kind of look like will-o'-wisps. They're like these little orange balls of flame that are basically invisible. They, they start, you, you can kind of see them, but you kind of can't, and they turn invisible, and they, they suck all the energy out of the world. Like like anything that generates power, they, they drain it. And so that they're kind of like energy parasites, and then they drain people, and they disintegrate people, and it doesn't look good. Um, the effects, the, what, what they do is they kind of, these, these little shimmering clouds run into people and they they erupt into like dust and the effect looks really bad it looks like something i would do it, it, it mean really like it looks like something i could whip up in 30 seconds in after effects like just kind of do a little kind of a, a sphere lens distort and crossfit you know I, it really looks bad it, it looks like something i could figure out in no time flat and I don't often say that because I really have a lot of respect for the guys who do a lot of visual effects. This looks shitty, um, but anyway, Final Destination. Um, you got to understand where I come from when it comes to horror movies. I'm actually a big fan of horror movies, but I define horror movies a lot different than a lot of people define horror movies. When when I when I say horror movies, a lot of people think uh, Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, uh, Hellraiser, the Nightmare on Elm Street series, you know, Freddy vs. Jason, Jason X, uh, uh, oh, uh, Halloween, and stuff like that. Anything with, um, and, and, and those series have evolved and kind of recessed, and there's, you know, they vary wildly in quality, but 
there's a certain kind of subgenre of horror movie that is really nothing more than um, for gore hounds. It, it's it's a gore hound film, and I never I don't like gore. I like just here's what it is. Um, let's the, the most recent example I can think of is Freddy vs Jason, which I hated, absolutely hated, and a lot of movies do this where it basically sets up. Uh, a bus full of people who are just one stereotype after the next and who are all as aggressively annoying as possible. They are all just horribly annoying. And the point of the movie is you cannot wait, cannot wait to see Jason Voorhees shove a machete through their face or kill them in some excruciatingly painful way. To me, that is not horror. Horror is when I actually care about the people and I don't want them to get hurt. When I'm actually rooting for the slasher, that's a comedy. So, if 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 I'm talking like the some of the uh, the later Friday the Thirteenth movies where it's really just a bunch of stoners and sluts getting hacked to death and and getting you know rocks shoved in their gut and you know, they really have no defining traits aside from their ethnicity uh, you know ethnicity or sexual promiscuity or what kind of kind of drugs they have or you know jock nerd whatever. When they're just annoying people who are just being lined up to get killed by the slasher, that's not a horror movie. That is a comedy. And that's what Final Destination is. And you have to go in to Final Destination with that mindset. If you're going in there thinking, oh, this is going to be scary. This is going to be, um, this, you know, I, I'm going in this thinking this is suspense. It's not that. This is an itchy and scratchy cartoon. This is Spy versus Spy. Um... This is Rube Goldberg if Rube Goldberg were a sadistic motherfucker. Um, the, the plot is essentially the same in every single one of these movies. Somebody gets a premonition that um, allows them to avert, uh, or to, to avoid some kind of disaster. So, like, the guy in this movie has a vision. He's on a bus, and he has a vision. He has this nightmare of the bridge collapsing and everyone dying. And so he wakes up from the dream, and he sees they're on the bridge, and the exact same thing is happening. He's like, we gotta get off the bus! We gotta... And so the, he leads all these people off the bus, and, of course, the bridge collapses. And, you know, every, the, every movie starts off that way. And really, from there, it just becomes the people dying one by one, in really, really ridiculous, and most of the time, really funny ways. Um, where they make it fun is that Gorehounds will love this movie. Um, and and actually, I, I hate this kind of movie, and this was pretty good as far as this type of movie goes. Um, there's a lot of good things I liked about it, and the, it starts off with the credit sequence. The opening credit sequence is actually very reminiscent of those early 80s uh, slasher flicks. In fact, the, like the font, the, the white, the, the white very block font on a black background they use is very reminiscent of the early Friday the 13th 1980s flicks. So I think I kind of know where they're coming from with this. It, it really harkens back to that kind of movie where... You know, you know where it's coming from. You know, there's no surprises here, but at least it's kind of it. It, it kind of, I don't know. It, it knows its identity at least. You know, it, it, it's not. It's not. It does what it does, and it does what it does well. You know what I mean? You may not like what it does, and if you don't like what it does, don't go see the movie because it's not going to win you over. But if you kind of, if you're amused by that idea, you want to see annoying people get fucking killed in really funny ways. It's a lot like those 1980s slasher flicks where you see stoners get whacked. Um, the 3D, I actually, I would not have gone to see this in 3D because I never go see 3D movies because they give me a headache. Um, was good. The 3D was actually, I, I almost never say that because every time, almost every time I've seen a 3D, not every time, almost every time I've seen a 3D movie, I hate it. Um, I think it's distracting and I, it tends to make things out of focus and that still was in evidence here but this was about as good as ever, ever I've ever seen 3D get. The best was Drive Angry. Um, this movie was really clearly shot with 3D in mind because people keep lurching out of the shadows with like these big fucking shish kebab needles and or what you, shish kebab spears and you know people keep pointing right into the camera things are flying into the camera so like when somebody gets impaled on a piece of rebar you know, the rebar comes right at you. Um, it's well done. It's, I, I still have a problem with it because what happens is you get this depth of field effect where you can see the subjects of the scene clearly, 
You so like if there's a person here and a person here, you can see them clearly, but the background is very fuzzy. Um, I don't like that. So, it, it, as long as you're focusing on the subjects at hand, you're not, you can't look around and, and notice things in the scene. You don't have any time to take in the scenery. So, cinematography is actually very difficult. It's well shot in 3D, but I just don't like the 3D effect. But still, it's well done for what it does. Um, so, what can I say about this flick? Um, huh. Okay, this movie, uh, again, if you think about this flick for more than five minutes, uh, this this whole plot falls apart. Because, um, let's just take some of the kills, for example. Um, they, they, uh, the guy, the guy, our protagonist, I, I, don't, I never knew his name. You don't know anybody's name in this. I know the girl's name is Molly, but you never know anyone's name aside from their one defining characteristic. Um, by the way, the main character's friend, I forget his name. Uh, I think it's Josh or something like that. The main character's friend looks and sounds exactly like Tom Cruise. Fucking exactly. He, he's got the smile. He's got the hair. His voice. It is freaky. It's like they went into a time machine and got Tom Cruise from the set of Risky Business and put him in this movie. But there's a lot in this movie that is really funny that, that doesn't make sense. For instance... The, uh, the guy gets all the people off the bus, they survive. And the cops are immediately really suspicious of this guy. So they drag him in, and they think he did it. They think he had something to do with it, because there's no way he could have known that this happened. So they're questioning him, and they're questioning all his friends, thinking maybe he's a terrorist, or just trying to figure out... The, the cop is actually very good in this flick. He's suspicious, but he's like, how, how... He doesn't understand any of this. And so he's trying to put it together but it, it's all very weird he's just, you know so this you know if the guy was going to collapse the bridge why did he pull people off the bridge you know so what's funny is he's about to put this guy away for more questioning when all of a sudden this guy comes in the interrogation room and he's like sir um we just got a report back from forensics um there it turns out they're blaming the collapse of the bridge on uh extreme high st uh, high stress because of wind like the wind was really severe and that's what caused the bridge collapse okay first off when investigating this type of disaster, it takes something on the order of like four to six months before forensics will come with any kind of definitive conclusion as the cause of uh, as as the cause of the disaster. They won't even speculate. It takes investigators months. So the fact that like forensics came back within the day, you know, eighty four people died in this bridge collapse, and the forensics took one look at this and went, "Yeah, that was wind." Shit. <laughs> so, um, uh, th th by the way, that bridge scene is actually very well done. I was very impressed with the uh, the sheer level of carnage that was going on on that bridge scene. Um, there, there's so much chaos going on there. Um, it's really I, I can't keep, I keep saying it's really well done, but it is. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of drama going on. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, really cool things happening, and the the kills in this case are very very visceral and gory. And a lot of it is CG, but it's still very well done CG. Now, it, it depends on whether that CG gore distracts you. I still am a huge fan of very practical effects, but there's no way they could have done this with practical gore. Uh, one of the most horrible kills I saw. <laughs> Everyone will have their favorite, but um, I think it's Rob Corddry. If it's not Rob Corddry, it looks like the guy. Um, the bald boss. Uh, he's hanging from the bridge, and all of a sudden this fucking... like this boiler full of like hot tar erupts and covers him in hot tar and you see his skin start to melt he's like ah! and his he's holding on by his fingertips and the skin sloughs off his fingertips and you're like oh my god um like i said if you're a gorehound this is fucking brutal fucking gore and I have seen some of the gore effects in previous movies like The Final Destination. Not Final Destination, The Final Destination, which is actually Final Destination 4. You can make a chronologically confused about movie sequels on this series alone. You know, this and Fast and Furious. Or no, I'm sorry, The Fast and the Furious. Fast and Furious was uh, Fast and Furious 4, I think. Um, you know, like, I don't know why they changed the naming team. There's Final Destination 1 through 3, The Final Destination, and then they were just like, Fuck it. Final Destination 5. Jesus Christ. So, um, there's, there's, there, there's several scenes that are actually, I was surprised at how tense they came out to be. 
there's a scene with a gymnast where there's like a nail or there, there's a screw on the fucking balance beam and she's doing flips and all this shit and they're like you're like oh she's gonna hit that fucking screw somebody's gonna step on that fucking screw at some point and it drags it out it drags it out over like five minutes and you're like somebody's gonna step on the screw and it's setting you can see it's cut with all these little cutaways of things happening things are getting set up there's a frayed piece of electrical wire there's an air conditioner that's losing it's losing a screw and there's there's water dripping down from the condensation it's 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 shockingly well it's shockingly I won't say well done anymore it's shockingly suspenseful to like just to see when somebody's gonna step on this fucking screw um again if you think about this for more than a minute this scene falls apart because <laughs> there's no way I refuse to believe there's any way there could be this fucking two inch screw sticking up on a balance beam and nobody would see it um now again i i'm not a gymnast clearly uh i don't know anyone who is a gymnast but i would imagine if you were a gymnast and you were practicing your eyes would be fucking locked on that balance beam if not you would occasionally glance down every once in a while and see this fucking screw just like i don't know like i know they kind of do these things where they're supposed to be looking ahead and i, I don't know but I, I refuse to believe nobody was looking at this uh, to even took a glance at the balance beam directly in front of them it was like oh shit and kicked that thing off um further when this girl finally dies when somebody does finally step on the screw and causes this girl's death which was actually really fucking grim uh, <laughs> Uh, I, there, do they not have spotters in practice in gymnastics? Again, not a gymnast, but in practice at least, I've I've actually seen meets, uh, you know, gymnastics meets, where even in competition they have spotters, and like, so like, there's nobody spotting her on the balance beam who could have seen this screw. There's nobody spotting her on the uneven bars, uh, who could have could have caught her if they knew something was clearly wrong C clearly wrong and so spoiler here's where i start getting into spoils the way she dies is she doesn't the, the girl who dies doesn't step on the screw somebody else steps on the screw she goes ah and she falls off the beam she knocks over the little the, the big tub of chalk the chalk flies in the air causes this huge cloud the girl who di is dying is on the uneven bars the cloud of chalk causes her to like cough and choke just as she's dismounting and she, like, fucking lands right on the top of her head and, like, folds her in half like a taco and it breaks her spine and, like, everything else in her body. She's fucking dead. Um, so, I was like, why did she dismount if she, like, if you... I, I know it all happened so fast. It happened in, like, the span of a second. But I just don't think you would dismount if there was fucking chalk being sprayed in your face. I would be like, oh, shit, I gotta stop. And, like, I think you would just hold on. You wouldn't go ahead with the dismount. Um... There's another, uh, the, probably the showcase kill in this movie was the, uh, the LASIK eye surgery scene, which is, you'll notice they do that, th that's the one scene they showcase in the trailers, is the eye surgery scene. So, um, if you're at all, this movie ruins a couple things for you, uh, it ruins, it ruins acupuncture, and it ruins laser eye surgery, if like if you have a thing with eyes, do not watch this movie. And that's where I say this movie is actually very good. Because, um, again, I don't like this kind of movie, but I can appreciate when it does something well. A movie like Jaws, I'm not comparing this to Jaws, but a movie like Jaws basically ruined the beach for almost everybody. You know, because they were afraid of fucking sharks. By the way, there was a shark attack movie in the previews. It's called, uh... Shark something. <laughs> Duh. It's, it's... What is it? Um... Oh. I can't remember what it is. It's shark something. Um, there's... It, what, what it is is it's like a saltwater... It's like a lake. And there's a shark in the lake where sharks would never be. And it, the, it turns out, like, some maniac put a shark in the lake to kill people. I don't know. Um, but anyway... The, that that move Jaws ruined the beach for people. It made people fucking afraid as hell of sharks. This movie will fucking ruin you for laser eye surgery. If you're even thinking about getting laser eye surgery, do not watch this movie. You will be afraid of this shit for the rest of your fucking life. Even if you know it's completely ridiculous, and it is, there's no fucking way this would ever actually happen. 
I, I'm almost certain the kind of laser they're talking about is not the cutting kind of laser that that, that is in this movie. But, um, yeah. You could know it's ridiculous and still be scared shitless by this scene. Um, so if you've got a thing with eyes, like if you, like, popping eyes or, like, cutting eyes or something like that, I know a lot of, I have a thing with teeth. Like, anything that involves breaking teeth, I can't watch that. The eye thing I was actually pretty okay with, but not anymore. Jesus Christ. Um, so if you, if the eye thing, ooh, don't watch that. Um, the acupuncture scene didn't bother me all that much. I thought that was just more stupid than anything else, where the guy falls off the bed. He's got acupuncture needles all over him. And they actually kind of spoil that one in the movie, where he just kind of falls off. Um, what happens with the eye surgery scene is the guy, of course, has to leave, the doctor has to leave the room and, a glass of water falls off a thing, falls in the electrical socket, and this causes an overload in the laser. And she, of course, can't move because her, she's like her head's pinned, and she can't turn the laser off. And so the laser fucking overloads to like 1.21 gigawatts, and when it finally fires, it shoots out like this beam, like the fucking Death Star. And it like you can see the laser like start cutting into her eyeball. It starts like cutting like a figure four into her eyeball, and she's like, "Oh my god!" And there's like there's like vitreous humor spraying out of this, like, "Oh!" And you're like, "What the fuck?" And she puts her eye in front of it, and it's cutting her hand up and like burning through it. She's like, "Ah!" And she gets up off the bed, and she's got like blood fouling out. She's like, "Oh my god, help me!" And you're like, "You're like, oh fuck, this is sick." Um, so. <laughs> So, if that sounds like something you want to watch, if that sounds funny to you, go see Final Destination 5. I don't need that shit in my life. But I have to admit, um, the effects were very good. They, they, I won't call them believable, because you could tell it's, you know, of course, cheesy. Uh, um, it, the effects are cheesy, but good. You know what I mean? Um... It uses the 3D to great effect, and th this scene will be remembered for the laser eye surgery scene. And, and honestly, that is something to be proud of. Um, there's a real blurring effect, but there's so many movies out there. There's so many Friday the 13th and slasher flicks and, and gore movies and killer monster movies and alien invasion movies. They all kind of blur together. So when you've got a movie that is memorable for something, that's pretty special. So this movie actually did set up... Like, I, I will probably never forget the, the fucking screw on the balance beam scene, the fucking acupuncture scene, stupid as it was, um, and, the, and the laser eye surgery scene, which was fucked up. Um, again, I could easily see why people would hate this movie. In fact, I kind of hated this movie, but that's just me. I can actually kind of take myself out of the equation and admit that the, in terms of tradecraft, this was good. So uh, that's about all I got when it, when it comes to Final Destination. Um, oh, no. The, the Candyman is in this movie again, and all he does is just kind of repeat the exact... I swear to God, they just cut and pasted the script from his the first movie into this movie where all he does is just he kind of glowers at people and goes you all be careful now and they're like what do you mean he goes death doesn't like to be cheated Th and that's it you know um wh okay well I i'll tell you why i don't like this movie this movie more than any of the others because i can't believe this has gone on for five movies at this point because for one there's no clear antagonist it's just kind of people are just dying because death, you know, death catches up to you. And that's not really an antagonist. So it's really, really hard to sustain any kind of suspense or momentum when it's clearly just basically the audience killing the people in the movie. The only, like, it, it's, it's kind of like a quantum horror thing. If we don't watch it, these people don't die. So Final Destination, the best way I can explain this series is basically if you made a movie out of if you made a movie in a world where god was you playing the sims <laughs> so, so you know how people play sims just to fucking murder people or set their house on fire just to watch them burn or or gag to death on their own vomit or 
you know, that kind of thing. If you were God and really fucked up, this is the world that Final Destination inhabits. Where, it, it, and what, what frustrates me about this movie is it never provides any kind of answer. I always try to look for a story in movies, and that's why I kind of don't like the gore flicks, because it's all about the gore. It's all about the kills. Um, I can't, there's no, for me, there's no point in watching this kind of movie. It's just boring. And so the kills were so good that it actually was not all that boring, but it was still kind of pointless. Um, when there's no hope, and there is no hope for any of these characters, trust me, they all die. They all die in every flick. When there's no hope for any of the characters, and they basically know there's no hope, I, I, I can't get invested in any of them. I don't care if they live or die, because they're all going to die. In fact, in these movies, they might as well just save themselves the time and kill themselves in a relatively painful way. Um, I'm surprised nobody's actually taken that course of action yet in these movies. Um, it, it, it's, it's just it's frustrating because even with the slasher movies, at least there's some kind of personification that you can be afraid of. It's not just... It's literally the director just making things up. You know, how do we kill this guy? You know, this guy goes to a massage parlor. Well, they, you know, so the director goes, well, how do you die in a massage parlor? And so they just kind of string together this ridiculous chain of events. It doesn't matter how it happens. It just, things fall on things and f things fall out of other things. And eventually something heavy falls on the guy's head. Um, the only real suspense from Final Destination, even this one, comes in... They set up a way you think somebody is going to die, but they don't die that way. So what happens is, like, let's say there's a knife balancing on the edge of a counter, and they keep setting up the knife, or they'll keep setting up a gun on top of a stove, or something like that. So as everything's going on, tension is building, the, the music is climaxing, things are getting really stressful, the strings are going to... And, you know, things are really simmering, people are about to die, there's a gun glowing red hot, it's about to go off, the knife is shaking on the table, and then the knife falls off the table, the guy falls down, and the knife sticks in the, fr sticks in the floor right next to him. And you're like, oh shit, that didn't happen. Then the gun goes off, knocks some heavy pans off the shelf, and the heavy pans fall off and crush the guy's head. And you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. That was really funny. Um, so it's that kind of, it, it's, it's, that's why I say it's a comedy. It's because you're watching these guys die, but you're watching them die in really goofy manners. Um, like, and, and where I find it frustrating is there's no struggle here. There's no way to win. You know, it's it's so frustrating when it's just a snuff film at some point. It's just a gore reel. And in fact, at the end of the movie, there is literally just a gore highlight reel where they show, like, every single kill from every single Final Destination movie to the strains of ACDC's If You Want Blood, You Got It. I'm not even kidding. This thing goes on for, like, three or four minutes where they show every single fucking kill in, in these movies. So if you ever had a doubt this was anything but a comedy, that highlight reel should just hammer it home for you. Um, I was talking about um, and the one question I always wanted answered that they never even approach in this movie is who's giving these guys the premonitions how are they getting these visions they just have them um, so wh what I get out of this is let's just assume this is a world where death is you playing the sims death is this really really sadistic motherfucker who just makes shit up to make people die in really hilarious ways. Let's just roll with that. Let's just roll with the idea that nobody ever puts the pieces together except the, except the candy man who's seen this shit happen all the all these times before and knows exactly what's going on. Really, after five movies, after, after four movies anyway, do you really think nobody would put this together where like there's some huge disaster Eight, you know, six to eight people survive, and then they all die in really, really memorable and hard to clean up ways. It's it's unbelievable how nobody put these together. Like you know, people are getting scythed in half from some piece of scrap metal that flies off a NASCAR, um, and you know they they get cut in half or they just my God, 
nobody would forget these. These things would be like all over the news. Where like how you know the thou- the show A Thousand Ways to Die would be all over this shit. And eventually, someone would ask the question. A report. You don't have to be a great reporter to put this together and be like, wait a minute. All these survivors who were just insanely lucky died in insanely unlucky ways. Like five days afterwards. Should we put the pieces together on this one? So nobody asked the questions. And so there's actually a really good movie I liked called, it, it's by Takashi Miike called One Missed Call. Not the Jessica Alba, not, well, actually, I don't think it was Jessica Alba, but there's an American remake. Don't watch that one. Watch the Japanese version of One Missed Call, which I really, really liked because at some point the media puts this together. This Let's just roll with the premise that in One Missed Call, this phone, there, there's some kind of possessed phone. There's like a ghost that inhabits phones that kills you. It's a little more complicated than that, but it starts to become this piece of folklore where you get this really mysterious call that tells you how you're going to die. And then you die that way. Um, so nobody really takes it seriously. It's kind of like the bloody Mary myth. You know, you say bloody Mary in the mirror and so like, so they're like, Oh, if you get the call, you're going to die. And they're like, Oh please, nobody gets that call. So, but people actually do start dying from the phone. And so what happens in that movie is the media approaches these girls and goes, you got the call, right? You got the call from the haunted phone. And they're like, yeah, they're like, we'll keep you safe. We'll keep you in a safe house where nothing could possibly hurt you. We'll have you on camera all the time. All we want to do is watch you. So when the appointed time comes, whether or not you're really going to die. And I was blown away by the ingenuity of that scene where people actually do put together the, the ridiculousness of these deaths and then actually start asking questions about it and trying to prevent it. So like it, it actually becomes a thing where like the national media like obsesses over this. It's kind of like paranormal activity where like if in par- if if in paranormal activity this shit was actually happening and and they released a movie based on this this would be like a worldwide phenomenon this basically proves the existence of ex- you know, uh, supernatural life or supernatural shit going on people would actually start to obsess over this and go to this house and shit um so th- I love that's why I love one this call final destination never even fucking approaches that where they they ask the guy the guy asks the question he goes he goes um if death's coming for us, maybe there's something out there that wanted me to live because I got the vision. You know, I, I, I had this premonition that saved me. So maybe there's something out there fighting for us. He doesn't, I actually don't think he says that. He's like, maybe I'm supposed to live if I got the premonition. So, and, and I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. Who's giving this guy the premonitions? Is there some force of good out there that's trying to override death's plan? If so, what is it? Is it like God? Is God trying to save these people? Or is it death giving this guy premonitions just to fuck with him? Because at this point, it's really hard to argue with the fact that death is intentionally trying to fuck with people just before they die. It, it like, it's, it's almost like God in this universe is a kid who's burning ants with a magnifying glass. You know, it, it's, it's that... It's really fucking sadistic. And this is not the kind of world you would want to be in. This is a world where God actively hates you and is the kind of God that pulls the wings off flies, uh, where flies are human beings, you know, just it's fucking grotesque. Lars von Trier didn't, uh, didn't approach this in Antichrist, you know, the, the, in anti, even in the movie Antichrist, it approached a world where basically the devil was God, you know, the devil had won and then there was no, you know, th- there was no ever loving God who, who could save you. It was all just, it, you know, whatever. It, I'm, I'm actually starting to approach really heady issues of philosophy and this is what I think about and, it, and this movie doesn't think about it at all it's just a gore flick and that's what frustrates me is it there's really nothing more to it than that it's fluff it's blood it's guts and it'll make you squirm it's that kind of squirmy uncomfortable movie that you really shouldn't take a date to <laughs> do not take a woman to this movie do not do it unless that woman is very into gore flicks, which I doubt. But um, this is a bad idea. It's a trap, okay? Uh, if if she's thinking, I think I should go get laser eye surgery. Go no! Oh my god. So my praise for this movie is mixed. Uh, it really comes down to the audience. And so in a way, maybe I shouldn't have even gone to see this movie because the audience for this movie is already built in. You already know. 
if you want to go see this movie. Um, maybe I convinced you one way or the other. Um, if this has seemed at all amusing to you, like if you want to have a good laugh, that's the movie to go see. Uh, there was one movie called, uh, it's called Atrocious. That what it's it's like a, I think it's a Spanish Spanish language movie. It's a horror film. It's another one of those found footage movies. Very very Blair Witch. Um, it's not playing anywhere near here, and I want I kind of wanted to go see that, uh, but it's not it's not playing around here. Paranormal Activity three was screening. Uh, that was the that was the trailer I forgot was Paranormal Activity three. I'm very curious about that movie. I love the Paranormal Activity movies, and I know that kind of makes me a pariah. That one's a really love or hate type of movie. You know, a lot of people go nothing happens in that movie. It's bullshit. And I just love the atmosphere it sets up. I don't believe in ghosts for a second. I really don't. I don't believe in anything supernatural, really. But I love to hear stories about it. And I love that kind of mythology that they've set up. Um, Paranormal Activity 3 is a prequel set in the 80s. And I'm very curious to see how they go about this. Because in the Paranormal Activity movies, they did a very good job of giving you a good reason why there was such ubiquitous filming all over the house. Like, they believed there was a break-in in the house, and so they put this really state-of-the-art security system so they could watch everywhere. And so that's why there was cameras all over the place. Um, in the first movie, the guy actually set up the cameras because there was supernatural stuff going on, and he kind of wanted to YouTube it, you know what I mean? So that's why that's why Mika put these cameras up everywhere and, and was doing this shit. That's why those were so good. But in the 80s, it's really hard to justify that kind of ubiquitous filming going on at all hours of the day because... When you're talking about back in the day, I'm recording on SD cards. You can record on hard drives. And even on DV tapes, it's a little more believable. You can record kind of bulk. But back in the day, in the 80s, you were shooting on beta or probably more accurate VHS tapes. And so these little the premise, I think, is the little girls from Paranormal Activity, you know, who are grown up in 1 and 2... They're little girls in this movie because it's a prequel, and they're taping. They have a they have a camera on a tripod, and they're taping just kind of goofy. They're just kind of running around doing goofy shit, and then paranormal stuff starts happening. But it's kind of hard to explain why these little girls have. It, it depends on, on on how spread out these events of the movie are, but uh, you only get like ninety minutes on a, on a VHS tape at best. Well, maybe if shooting on EP, but yeah, I don't know. But it, it you'd have to have a lot of videotapes to kind of get all this footage so i don't i don't know it, it'll be interesting to see how they how they kind of explain that it's it's a juggling act because as i've said before paranormal activity really relies on there not being any artifice um when you start to see the hand of the writer creep in or the hand of the director kind of being silly or making things convoluted or or contrived uh when you can see that artificial plotting in paranormal activity it loses a lot of its magic when you can actually kind of set aside your suspension of disbelief and think for a second, just a second, that this could be, like, if, if this was real, this looks real. This looks like something really fucking scary is happening here. Um, when it doesn't look phony, there's not CG blood and rebar sticking out through people's eyes and people getting cut in half with sheet metal. You know, when it's very subtle and very, very mysterious... And it's it looks authentic, or it's just shady enough to you don't get a good glimpse at it. It's 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 hinted more than shown. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. And so it's it's a very fine line they walk. And Paranormal Activity three, I'm always very curious. With one, I thought they'd screw it up. In two, I rather like two. And so again, with three, I'm going into this really hoping I'm going to like it. But always, I'm very eagle eyed watching for stuff that that nitpicks me. I'm just god damn it and so as a very nitpicky guy final destination five was is not the movie for me i'm like are there no spotters how did they get forensic data back so quickly i'm just like ah um anyway i'm rambling on uh, i hope you enjoyed this i'm gonna go get back to work i have tekken to watch or I, I actually have tekken to shoot i've watched it several times already but i have tekken to shoot so until next time see you at the movies